just before I start, yeah, already you did it. I was just about to ask you about the recording. Okay. Anyway, so let me share my screen. Let me know if you all can see now. Yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. So let me walk you through the agenda for today's uh, session. So we will talk about the email automation using uh, Studio, then some basic string manipulation, which we can perform using Studio. And when you will be developing some projects, then this is the most important part, uh, which you need to use it more frequently. Then we will talk about date formatting. This is also interesting where when you work with Excel automation, then uh, you need to format a lot of dates and you need to play with it. And then debugging and error handling in studio. Then we, uh, then we will talk about orchestrator assets, so how we can use the orchestrator assets with the studio and why orchestrator assets is really needed. Then we will talk about the orchestrator queues, how we can publish a project in studio. Uh, deployment of a project in the orchestrator, and then we will wrap the session and we'll give you the overview of uh, UiPath Academy. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about you the email automation and uh, how we can perform email automation using UiPath Studio. So to start with, uh, this is the main uh, activity package which we need to install in the UiPath Studio, which is called UiPath Mail Activity Pack. And this package is needed because all the activity belongs to uh, email will available under this one. So if you don't see any of the email activity in UiPath Studio, you can go there and uh, download the this UiPath mail activity pack. And this will help you to send, receive, or filter different types of email from the uh, email mailbox. Uh, this is the main uh, type, you can say, where system.net mail messages. This is a type of uh, type format for an email. So this is how an UiPath Studio project recognize that, okay, this is the mail, this is the main property. Uh, we will show you in the today's session that uh, you can send a customized email by adding a customized subject, custom body. You can add attachment as well. Even you can use a template uh, to download the, uh, uh, to send an email or to download the attachment as well. Uh, now, uh, let me show you the applications or the integrations available with uh, various uh, various protocols or the uh, different type of uh, emails which we can use. So now we can send an email with uh, Gmail Outlook. And as you can see in the screenshot, we can send email with Exchange, IBM Notes, IM, IMAP, Outlook, POP3, SMTP. And you can create customized email HTML content as well. So that means you can send an email by using uh, HTML body. You can save attachment, you can save the entire mail message as well. Uh, some of the Outlook activities are really easy to configure and they don't require much to set up, but for other activities, you need to plan and you need to configure it in a proper way. Uh, and the Outlook activity, they work with API. So if you have a desktop application installed also, that, that means if you have the Outlook client installed in your computer, then it's easy, really easy to configure where you do not need to uh, put uh, so much configuration parameter that I will show you in the next next uh, slide. Uh, so yeah, so Outlook activities are uh, comparatively easier than the others. Now, let me uh, walk you through the uh, some of the practices we, which we will do with the UiPath Studio, where we will try to send email, we will try to send email with the different type of bodies. We will try to use HTML body as well in the email. So let me start with the get email because this is interesting. Uh, and most of the you uh, might struggle in the first time when you try to get an email or when you try to read an email from, uh, from your Outlook. So for that, what you need to do, there is an activity available. So if you go in the activity panel and if you look for get Outlook mail message activity, then you will see there are various activity, uh, there are available activities available under Outlook. Now, if I look for Outlook, then you will see all the activities are available related to Outlook. So these all are the uh, operations you can perform with Outlook. And there are uh, activities available with the Gmail and Outlook together. So you can use a, a Outlook desktop application if you don't have the Outlook client installed in your computer. So here I have used the Outlook mail message activity to get the email where you need to provide all these configuration parameter. So as Outlook client is already installed in my computer, then I don't need to provide account. 
uh, because account is default. So UiPath Studio will recognize the account automatically from my system configuration. I need to put the mail folder. So from which mail folder are you trying to receive the email? So as of now, uh, if I open my Outlook, then you will see here, I have different mail folder. So I'm gonna read email from this RPA summer school folder. That's why I have to configure here inbox, then backslash RPA summer school. By default, it will come with inbox. So if you don't put anything, if you don't change anything, then robot, uh, then this activity is going to read the email from your main inbox. Now the another options which you have it here, you can apply filter. So you can put filter so that the email with, with matching this particular filter will only be uh, retracted by this activity. You can filter by message IDs as well. Uh, you can re you can mark those email as read. So for example, if you are using a, this activity, then you can mark those email as read because uh, your studio has already read those emails. Uh, you can configure to read only unread messages from your Outlook message box. Uh, you can filter your uh, emails by date as well. So there are two options, a newest first and oldest first. So you can uh, decide which one you want. The top 30, which is very, very important here. So when you say top 30, uh, top and by default, it will come with 30. So you can change it. So that means how many emails, number of emails you would like to re receive and read it in a one go. So as of now, I am reading 30, although I have just one email in that inbox. But if I put 30, so anything less than 30 will be okay, but it will not read anything more than 30. Now the email, once the this activity will read the email, the email will be stored in this output called list mail. And then once we have this, so which I already presented that this will have the collection of mail messages. That means it's a list of all the emails, uh, which is extracted by studio. Now to read this email, we need to apply a for each loop. So in the for each loop here, I'm doing a right line. So what does it mean? I'm just trying to see what is the count of email, which is read by UiPath Studio. And then after that, we will, I have just added a for each loop. So for each item in the mailbox, I'm trying to write the, read the subject and write it here in the studio. I'm trying to read here the body of that email. And then I'm saving the attachment as well. So as you see here in this email, I have this, this is my body of this email. This is the subject and this is the attachment. So let me run this workflow in front of you and we'll see how it works. So if I just say run file. So execution is started and you can see in the output panel, the output. So first it will show number of emails. So number of email count is only one. Then you can see this is the subject. Subject is this one and this is the body. This is the body and the, the, the output is saved here. So you can see this is the attachment downloaded by uh, robot. And to get the uh, various parameter, what you can do. So this is your item. When I say item, that is that means this is your mail. So for example, if you need to some uh, read some other parameter, then you can say item dot. And then you will get a list of things you can get. So if you want to get the CC, BCC, or if you want to copy this, if you want to get the date of the email, uh, then you can do it and you can play with it. So th there are many options available. Uh, if you want to get the sender email address, you can get it from here. So you just need to say item dot sender email address, and then it will give you the, uh, the email sender name. So this is how the get email works with UiPath Studio. Now let's jump into the send email. So to send an email, what you need to do again, look for send Outlook mail messages activity. So if I look for send Outlook mail messages, uh, you can see here, this is the activity, which is really easy to configure as, as compared to the other, other things. So you can see here, I need to put two where uh, to whom we need to send an email. So this is the sender. Uh, this is the person who, who is going to receive this email. Then you, you need to put subject and you need to put body. Here is an option to attach the um, attachment as well. So here I have attached this attachment called demo attachment demo.txt. There are various parameters uh, again, uh, but these three are mandatory ones. So two subject and body. And if this CC and BCC are optional, so if you want, you can put the CC as well and BCC. Uh, if you want to keep the sensitive sensitivity, you can see here, there are many options called normal, personal, private, and confidential. If you want to send this email as confidential, just make it confidential. 
as of now i'll keep it just normal you can also reply to via this activity you can save this email as a draft you can use body as an html which i will show you in the next slide and you can also keep the importance so there are again three options low normal high so you can set the importance okay. here uh, you can also send email on behalf of someone and you can also forward the email. So by using this activity, you can reply to any email or you can forward this email. So now let's run this workflow quickly. So now when, when this, ex this execution will be done, then I will receive an email from myself because I'm sending this email from my account only. So now you'll see, I have, ju I have just now I have received an email. If I open, this is my email. And you can see this is a test one email from RPA Summer School. And this is also the subject and body with attachment. Now let's jump, jump into the another one, which is called send an email using HTML. So what does it mean? This is the advanced version of sending an email. Let me just open the HTML file first. So if I go to demo, then you can see this is how my HTML body looks like. So this body say, hi, this is the test to email for RPA summer school and then my signature. So I can uh, provide the custom uh, custom body here in the in, in a HTML format and I can send an email with this body. So you can see what I'm doing here. First, I need to read the email body from the text file. So which is as a string and then you can use the send outlook mail message activity to send an email. and let me just hit the run button and then I will show you what is the difference between the first one and the second one. So now execution started, but the main difference here is you can see is body HTML property is checked because I'm using HTML body so that I need to check this uh, checkbox. I have received the second email as well, which is this one. And you can see the email is in proper format with hi, this is the email and my signature. Now you can also include link in the email. So for example, let me just enable this part. And let me just disable this part. So now I'll show you the second email body, which I have prepared with an hyperlink. So let's say, for example, if you want to send some hyperlink in an email with saying that, okay, please find the link to RPA to UiPath community portal. So you, I will receive this email with hyperlink to this website. Let me just run the robot. And it's done. Let's check the output. It might take a couple of seconds. Here you go. So this is the email uh, I have received and you can see, please find the link to the community, community portal. And if I mouse over, you can see the links look like HTTPS colon double slash community dot dot com. So this is how uh, it works. So you can customize your email in as much as you want and uh, you can also use html body where you can put you can insert a table you can put a hyperlink or you can put whatever you want like a custom subject signature uh, salutation and everything so this is about the email automation if anybody is having any question then are we going to take it now christina or we will be taking in the end um, I think we should wait wait till the Q and A uh, since okay. now Josh and Ebu are doing a good job of answering the questions in the chat. So okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So let's move to the next topic. Now I'm going to talk about the basic string manipulation. So this is an important topic uh, in uh, UiPath Studio. So first, uh, let me tell you the definition of string. So what is string? So strings are the data type that correspond to a text. So anything related to text is called string. So a string is a, you can say a technical name of text in, a, in the IT world. So anytime uh, when you need, uh, when anything you can capture using your uh, activities, then the text we might need to manipulate sometimes in order to prepare the proper input or we need to formalize the uh, input, then we need to play with it. We need to uh, twist a little bit uh, to get the desired uh, desire string, which we can use it in our further automation. 
Uh, a string manipulation in UiPath will be done by string methods, which we borrowed from VB.net. You can get the full list of string methods uh, available at the Microsoft website. Microsoft website. This is the website. We'll share it with you. So you, here you will get uh, a list of all the string methods which we can use within the UiPath Studio to perform the string uh, string manipulation or string operations. Here I'm gonna show you some common string methods which uh, we use frequently within UiPath Studio during the uh, automation development. So first one is the concatenation. So when you want to concatenate two string, uh, then you can use this uh, method. How it works, you can see in the example. If you say string dot concat, and here you need to provide variable one, variable two. What what is the variable 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 two is your string number one and string number two. So if you want to join these two strings, you can use uh, con string dot concat then variable one and variable two. The second one is contains. Uh, this this is a very frequently used string where you need when you need to validate something. So you can use this one as well. So what does it mean? This string, uh, this method will check whether a specified string uh, found or substring can be found within a string on. Uh, and what is the output of this method is a Boolean value, which is true or false. So for example, let's say if you have an string and you need to check whether this substring is available within that string, then you can use this method. How it looks like variable name dot contains and you need to put test. So in your string, if it contains test, then it will return true. If not, then it will return false. So the output is Boolean value. The third one is format, uh, where we need to convert an entire expression into a string. So for example, let's say if you have multiple string and you are getting the, uh, you need to join multiple string and you need to format them in a single string before you can use it for the further processing in the automation, then you can use this uh, method. I will tell you the difference. So let's say a string dot format, and this is the format. So string dot format, where you need to pass your variable, uh, which you need to insert within a string. So let's say if you have a string and you need to insert something within the string, so then then you can use the format. I will show you in the demo how it works. The index of this is another method which returns a zero based index out of the first occurrence of a character in the string. So what does it mean? Let's say if you have a string and if you need to find out what is the index of A in that particular string, then you can use this. So this is how the syntax looks like is variable name dot index of A. So it will return whether, whether this A is at which place. So the output is in a uh, integer format. Another one, which is join. So this, this is used to concatenate the list of strings. So let's say, for example, if you have a collection of different, different uh, strings. So if you want to join all the, all of them together uh, by separating it with this pipe symbol. So then you can use this uh, method called join. How the syntax looks like is string dot join and the pipe symbol. And here you need to pass the variable collection. So collection variable, that means in the in this variable, there, mu there must be multiple strings available. So you it will give you the output in a, in a single string by separating all of them by this pipe symbol. The replace most important one, uh, which we use uh, more frequently within the UiPath Studio. Uh, so it will replace all the characters, which is available in a, uh, a string. So how it looks like, you need to uh, provide your uh, let's say, for example, if you have a string and you need to replace particular thing from that string, then you can put string dot replace. Here you need to pass the original value, and here you need to pass the string by which you want to replace the original value. So this is how the syntax looks like. Then they split. Sometimes we need to split a string into different different substring. Uh, let's say, for example, if you have a string and where you want to separate date and time. So then you can use this split method uh, by using this. You can split the uh, the, subs the string within into different substrings by giving a separator. And how the syntax looks like your string dot split. And let's say if I want to split this string using this pipe single, then you can use this one and then index. There are various methods available within the within the vb.net to split and string. This is one of them. I'll show you the another one in the demo. And the substring, 
which is also the most common used one. So for example, if you, if you have a long string and out of that you want to extract a substring, then you can use this, uh, this method. How it works, variable name dot substrings. Here, you need to pass the start index and the length. So for example, let's say if you have a string and you wanted to uh, extract only first four character of that string, then you need to pass substring zero, which will be your starting index of that string and length is four. So it's from zero to four, I wanted to extract as a substring. Let's move into the demo. I'll show you some uh, practical example, how it works. Let me just close this. And open a workflow, which I have prepared for this demo. So I have, uh, I have prepared workflow for separate examples like concatenate and contents, format string, replace string, split string, and substrings. So let me just disable all of them first because I, I just wanted to show you one by one. So if you want to concatenate two strings, so let's take an example. This is my string number one, which says RPA summer school. This is my string number two, which says 2022. Let's say if I want to get a string uh, by joining two of them, then what I will do, I, I'm using here concat method. So a string dot concat, and here you need to pass your string number one and string number two. This will give us the result of str result. And I'm, I'm printing here the result in this variable. The second one, I'm giving the example here for contents. So I'm just checking whether this output contains 2022. So this should give me the result in a Boolean value, but now I'm converting that result into a string just to print it here. Let's run this project and see how it looks like. Here you go. So you can see the first out, output is RPA summer school 2022, which is the result here. And it's returning me true because this is string contains 2022. Now, the interesting thing is you can see here, there is no space be between school and 2022. Why? Because we, we don't have any space when we join, we don't put any step, uh, space. There is one more method which you can use to concatenate string. I'll show you quickly. For example, let's say if you want your result called str result, and you wanted to join these two string, but you need a space between school and 2022. So you can use str1 plus str2, but we need to pass a space. So you can use a plus sign as well to join two strings. Now, what is the difference between this concat and plus sign? So this will concate will only support string type of variable when you try to join them. But with this plus, you can convert them and put it in an expression so that your uh, uh, expression will automatically convert it into string and it will give you the result. So here is the example of using plus. So if I run the robot, we will see the output where RPA summer school 22, 2022 has a space between school and 2022. Here you can see the this has a space available here. So RPA summer school 2022, and here is a space. And this returns true because 2022 is still there. So this is an example of concave and contents. Let's move to the another one. Let me just disable and move this one outside. The interesting one, which we called format string. So let's say if you have a string, uh, which looks like this RPA, and then this is a syntax, which I'm using and school. And I wanted to insert summer in place of this zero. So how you can do that for that, you need to use a string dot format method. So you can see here, string dot format. Here is your string, which is str3. This is your string. And I wanted to insert summer. So here I have just added summer. If I, if I want to print the result, then here is the result, which is in the str result. Let's say, let's imagine if you have two variable available here, then you need to put again in this bracket a one. 
two, three, four, five, and so on. So it depends upon number of uh, variable which you want to insert. Let's run this project and see how the output looks like. So you can see the summer has been inserted between this RPA and school. So this is how it works. And if I wanted to add 2022 as well in the end, then we need to put one here. And then I need to pass another variable because there are, we have added a two, method, two variables in the, in the main string, uh, in the main string. So let's say 2022. And if I run this project, and you will see my string looks like RPA summer school 2022 because I have inserted 0, 0, and 1. This, this method will be most useful when you try to insert uh, anything in your HTML email body. Uh, then you, you, you will use this method more frequently. Now let's move to another one. Let's disable this one and move to another one, which is replace string. How it works? For example, if you have a string called RPA summer school 2022, and if you want to replace 2022 with 2023, so then how the syntax looks like, str.replace 2022 with 2023. And the output will be here, RPA summer school, 2023 because we have replaced this 2022 with 2023 and here you go you can see the output so this is the the replace let's move to the next one which we call split, split string for example if you have a string let's say rpa summer school 2022 so if i want to split this string by space so you can see in this sprint, uh, in this string, there are spaces available. So this is the first one, this is the second one, and this is the third one. When I will split this string, then there will be four output. One is RPA, another one is summer, third one is school, and fourth one is 2022. So this is the syntax I'm using, which is another one. So split, and then I'm passing str4 and split with space. So here you can see, I'm splitting this string with a space. So this is the syntax I have added here. And here you can see if I, and this will split into the four parts, RPA summer school 2022, and I'm writing all the four parts here. And when we split any string, then it will return an array of string. So this ARR result is array of string. Let me run this workflow. So you will see the output. So first one is RPA, second one is summer, third one is school, and 2020. So this is how the split string works. Let's move to the next one, which is substring. So let me just enable this. Okay. So if we have a string, let's say RPA summer school 2022, and if I wanted to get RP out of it. So then how is the syntax looks like? str dot str4 dot substring. So I wanted to uh, extract something out of this string and I need only first three characters. So starting from zero, I need first three characters and this will return me RP. Let me hit the run button. And you can see it's giving me R. If I change this syntax, let's say if I need first eight character, then you just need to put eight here. And once you run this workflow, it will return the first eight character of this. History. So this is how the substring works. Let's move to next topic, which is date formatting. So, First, we need to understand what kind of date formats available. So this is the how the format looks like. So let's say, for example, uh, this is the method which we are using here. So date time dot now dot two string, and I need this string in the format dd slash mm slash yyyy. Then the output of this string 
Now the out output of this expression is this one. So you can say 12.08.2022. If I want, if you want the output in a different format, then you need to change this format here within this two string. So if I want, let's say MMDDYYYY, then it will give me 08.12.2022. If you want the month in character, so let's say in the short month format, AUG, then what you need to do, you need to paste DD slash MMM slash YYYY. If you need the full month name, then you need to put MMMM. And you, it's not necessary to always use this backslash. You can also use a space. So if you need the format like 12 August 2022, then you need to pass this format DD space MMMM space YYYY. I will tell you the, the meaning of the representation of this DD, MM, and YYYY here. And also, if you need any date with time, so then you need to pass HH, MM, SS, and then TT. And this is HH, MM, SS. I will tell you. So how the, how the output looks like, this is the date, this is the time, and this is AM or PM. What is the difference between HH and MM? You can see here, this is the 12 hour format and this is the 24 hour format. So here the time is 22, 10, 0, 8. And here the time is 10, 8, 21. But in here you can see the format, which is PM. And if you only need the time, then you can use dead time dot now dot two string with HH, MM, SS, and T. Now here, let's say DD represent the day of the month, which is 0, 3, 0, 5, 18, or 13. For example, if you don't need this zero, then just use simple D. It will give you the month without zero, without this leading zero. Now here M, MM represents the month number with leading zero. So you can see the MM represents month as 0, 1, 0, at 12. MMM, sorry, MMM represent the abbreviative month name, which is, let's say, June, May, December. This four times M represent April, June, December. Four times Y, 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 Y represents this year as a 2022. Here HH represents the hour in 12 hour clock format. And in capital H, two times represent the 24 hours clock format. So you can see the examples 0, 7, 0, 2, 12, and here 0, 6, 14, and 22. Now we can use uh, various methods for debt formatting, but I'm going to show you the most common used method for debt, debt formatting in UiPath Studio, how we can convert any date. So the first method is convert and then to date time. So how the syntax looks like is convert dot to date time. And here you need to pass your string. So you are trying to convert a particular string into a date format or date time format. So then you need to pass your string here. Input parameter in this method is a string. So a string represents the date and time. You can only keep date or you can put a date and time as a string. It depends. It will return uh, output as a date time. And if to give just to give you an example, how you need how it looks like. So convert dot to date time. And here you need to pass your uh, string, date string. The another one is date time dot parse exact method. Uh, this is the this is the strongest method I would say for date formatting because it can give you all the type of desired format. How the syntax looks like is parse exec, and then here you need to pass a string and a string and IE format for provider. So how the parameter looks like the string is the first string which which is contains the date and time which we need to convert, and this string means the format of a string. Which in which we are passing this string. I will show you in an example, but just to let you know, this is your input and this is the format of your input. And here you need to provide an object that supply the culture is for a specific format information about this string. It returns date and time. The syntax looks like date time dot parse exec. Let's take an example. This is my string, which I am trying to convert as a date name. So you can see here 12th of April, 2022. How do I know that this is 12th of April, not 4th of December? Because the format is DD, MM, YYYY. 
So you can see here date is 12th, month is 04, and year is 2022. So you need to put the format of this string here and then system.globalizationcultureinfo and then invariant culture. This is called I format provider. Let's uh, have a look to the demo of uh, date formatting. So let me just open the project. So how the uh, how the string looks like. So I'll give you the first example. Uh, let's let's take here. So for example, if you just wanted to uh, extract the year, then what you need to do, you need to say date time dot now dot two string, and you just need year, which is y y y y. Now this is an example how we can convert it to date and time. So you can see here convert dot date time. And I am passing this string. Now, you can see here, this is not in DD MM YYYY format. It is MM DD YYYY format. And which format you need to use, it depends upon your system format. So, as you can see, my computer has format called MM DD YYYY because this is 12th of August, not 8th of December. So, always if you use this method, then you need to pass the format like mm dd y y y y if you pass it as a dd mm y y y y it might give you error because there is no month for 16th so just always remember when you use this method always pass the string as your system uh, in, in which your system is uh, configured the next one which is time dot parse exit here is an example so dead time dot parse exit here you need to pass your string and the my string format is ddmmyyyy. Then I need to pass the information, culture information. So this will give me, this uh, method will give me the output as a date time, but just to write it, I'm converting it into ddmmmyyyy. I will show you the, how the output looks like. So let's uh, run this project and see. Let me just ignore this couple of things because I will show you in the next part of this workflow. Let's run this workflow and see the output. So first we'll return 2022 because we know we are in year 2022. We are converting it to date and time. So you can see here date and time is 11, 16, 2022 and time is by default 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The reason is because we haven't uh, provided time as an input. So by default, studio will take 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And output of this one is 11th of August, 2022. The reason is because I'm using the format TD, then MMM, and then YYYY. Now let's check this Excel example as well, because you will need to format this date from Excel many times. Let's imagine if you have an Excel, where a column contains dates. So for example, this is the date and you can see the date is 11th of August. It's not 8th of November, it's 11th of August because it's representing my system time. So you can see my system format is MMDDYYYY. Same format you can see available here. So to read this, what I'm doing, I'm just reading the, the Excel and keeping the value in this date time. And let's check how this looks like. And then I'm trying to convert this to only DD slash MM slash YYYY. Let me just run this file and then I will explain to you the output. Here you go. Just ignore these two because these two are coming from the beginning, but let's take an example. So this is how my date time is coming from the Excel, which is 0, 8, 11, 2022 and time. But I'm converting it into DD, MM, Y, 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 Y. So how I'm doing it, I'm passing the whole string from here. So I'm just passing this as a string into this date time or parse exact method. And here I need to specify the format and the format of my string is MMDDYYYY, HHMMSSS. And I'm converting this whole date into the format DDMMYYYY. And just to write it, I'm using two string. 
So the output is 11, 0, 8, 2022. So this is, this is the example of date formatting. Now, Christine, Christina. Yes, just a minute. So yep, I sure. set up the screen. Okay. So let's see now. So everyone, uh, as you should know by now, uh, go to www.menti.com. And I will copy paste uh, now in the chat the code you need to get into the quiz room. Okay. And we will wait for you to join the quiz room. Remember, it's also very easy to join from mobile, the quiz room. Do not worry. Okay, so we have 76 people, so about 70 in the meeting. Let's see how many we get into the quiz room. Okay, it seems like 43 is our number. Is there anyone who is having problems joining the quiz room? Okay, joined. 46, so still growing, okay. Okay, so we're up to 50. I think we can start the quiz now, 51. Okay, we will start now. So remember guys, answer fast to get more points. Menti is about that. Which string method can be used to replace all the occur occurrences of a sub substring in a string? We have substring, replace, contains, format. Yes, great answer, guys. So most of you got this one right. Let's move to the leaderboard now to see uh, who is our uh, intermediate leader, who was the fastest. Okay, so it's hash king. <laughs> okay, we will move to the second question now. We will have a bit more time on this question. Uh, I won't read it though because it's a uh, a bit complicated. Okay. Answer fast also. This was presented by Ronak just like five minutes ago. Okay, again, most of you got this one right too. It was a bit more complicated, more options. Let's see the leaderboard now. Okay, so now we have Akanksha in the lead. Remember, we will have two more questions towards the end of the session, and then uh, we will have our winner after the last session of Menti. Now I will switch back with Ronak to continue the presentation. Thank you. Let me share my screen again. Okay, can you see now? Yes. Okay. 
So let's start with this topic called debugging and exception handling in Studio. Uh, this is again an important one uh, when you do some advanced practice with Studio. So debugging is the process of identifying and removing the errors that occurs, you know, during your design phase or in your maintenance phase of the uh, of your boat. So uh, we have a dedicated debug option in the UiPath Studio where you can see uh, there are home design and debug. So this is a dedicated option where you can perform various operations to debug your code. I will. Uh, explain to you most of the common one, which we use frequently. Debug can be executed from both from design and debug. But if you wanted to use all these options, then you need to switch to debug tab here. So these are the options called step into, step over, step out, retry, ignore, and restart. So these all are the options. I will start with the simple one. So let's say if you need to restart the debug debugging process again. So you just need to click on this restart button. It will restart the debugging process from the first activity. Uh, the ignore button. If you want to ignore any encountered exception and continue to the execution of the next activity, then you can use this one. Retry. It will re-execute the previous activity. So restart, the difference between restart and retry is restart will restart from the activity number one, but retry will only uh, retry the last or previous activity in case if there is any exception. The more uh, useful, which is a step into, uh, because it will debug when you, when you want to debug your workflow, then this step into uh, button will debug the uh, activities one by one. The step over and step out. So step over will execute all the activity inside a container without opening the container. And step out will complete the execution of the activity in the current container and then pause the debugging at the current container level. Now let's move to the another one. These are the various debugging actions which we have. Let's say breakpoint, slow step, execution trial, highlight element, log activity, and continue on exception. So breakpoints, these are this can be used and which is a really uh, important one because let's say, for example, if you are debugging any workflow and you wanted to stop your workflow at a particular activity, then you can put some breakpoints there and the workflow will stop and then you will have a time to uh, evaluate the result of debugging and based on the results, you can either continue with the debugging or you can stop your or you can terminate your workflow. This slow step, uh, this is also a useful one when you will do the web automation because uh, UiPath Studio is very fast while interacting with the different web application. So you can slow down the execution of the activity. So it will debug in a, in a slower step. As of now in the screen, you can see it's off, but if you click, then there are options to uh, slow down into one time, two times, three times, and four times. Uh, the execution trail, it will show you the exact execution of the path at debugging. Highlight element will highlight the UI element. So uh, note this point, this is only applicable for UI element because if you are using, let's say Outlook or email activity, there is no UI element uh, involved. So you will not uh, get any of the elements highlighted within your workflow. This log activity will debug all the activities uh, and will try to log all the output in an, uh, all the activities log in the output panel. Important one, continue on error exception. For example, if you are debugging something and you know that there is already an exception, then you can just click on continue on exception. So when you click on that one, then it will just uh, log the exception in the output panel and will continue the execution. Let's move to the next one, which is called debugging panels. I will show you in a demo. So how it looks like, so when you run any workflow in a debug mode, then you will see various panels like locals, immediate, breakpoints uh, and then call stake watch and output just a point to note these all will be only available when you will run any workflow in a debug mode i will explain to you uh, later so let me just show you and explain to you via demo how it looks like so let's take an example we have a workflow here called get email and if you want to debug this, this uh, workflow, so what you need to do, you have two options. Either you can go to design tab and then click here and you can click on this button called debug file. Or if you want to use the advanced functionality of this uh, debug mode, then you can click on debug and you have an option. So if I, let me start with step into. So if I click on step into, then you will see my debugging is started. And 
our studio is going to debug all the activity one by one. So as of now, this is on the this email main sequence or container. If I click on step into, then it will move to the next one. That means uh, now we are debugging this one. If I click on step into, it will move to the next one. So it will take some time and it will move to the next one. So let's see uh, how the output looks like. So you can see output is started. What is call is text? So here you can see what, what all are the next activities which are going to be executed. So you can see here now right line is done, then email sequence will be executed. So if I just click on next, then you can see email. If I click on next, then you can see the for each. If I into uh, put, uh, click the next, then you can see the right line. So all these activities, so right line will be executed uh, next. So you can see that in the college, college step. The local, the local is the important one because here you will see what kind of input uh, you have uh, passed here. So there is only one argument you can see in my workflow and argument is some value. So for argument, you can see the value variable. You can see what is the value of the variable. You can see what is the property and you can see the property of the right line, which is the current one. So the property is text writer. The text is ronak.gupta at tomtom.com, even though you don't see here, but the item. So for this email, the sender is Rona Gupta. So that's why you can see my email address, which you don't see here. So by debugging this, you can check, okay, the, this is the input coming here at this place. The display name of this activity is right line. This is the activity ID. If I just click on step into, then it will move to the next one. And you can see the property of the next one. So here uh, it says this is a test email because the in the email body, it's like this is the test email for RPSMR school. So you can see all the values coming from here in this local panel. The watch, uh, you don't see anything for now because the workflow is really small and simple, but when you have more then you will see uh, uh, the results here. And then the next one is immediate. I will explain to you in the next slide. So let me just stop this workflow and let's talk about a breakpoint. So for example, if you want to stop this activity at this place, so what you can do, you can either right click and click on this toggle breakpoint point, or you can click this activity and click here toggle breakpoint. If I added a breakpoint and if I want to debug this file, then our execution will st stop at this activity. So now as of now execution is going on and now you can see the execution is stopped it because uh, we have added a breakpoint. You can add multiple breakpoints within your workflow so it will stop at one by one. And here in the breakpoint window, you can see all the breakpoints has been uh, added on different type of activity. Let me just stop it and let's add one more breakpoint here. So if I click here and toggle breakpoint, if I just run this file or run this in a debug mode, then you will see here there are two breakpoints and you can see in which activity these breakpoints has been added. So now the breakpoint one is arrived. If I just click continue and then it will uh, stop at the second breakpoint. Now, the important one, which is slow step. Uh, so for example, when we run this and when we debug this uh, workflow, it goes in a super fast mode. So we don't uh, get a real chance to look at each and every uh, activity. So to do that, I'll show you one moment. Let me just remove those breakpoints. So to run anything, so let's say if I say step into, if I stop this debugging and step into, but if I want to slow down the execution. So here you can see it's 1x, 2x, 3x, or 4x. So if I, I want only in 1x, then continue, then it will slowly move to the next step. So now you can see it's going slowly, slowly, slowly. And again, so this is how the execution is happening in a debug mode. If you want to uh, see the execution trial, just enable this and run this file in a debug mode. And it will show that, okay, this is done, this is done, this is, this is pending, this is pending, this is done, this is done, this is done, then this is done and this is done in the end and then the complete execution is done. So by clicking on this execution trial, you can see how the execution is going on. Now, 
let me tell you the here. So in the local, you can see the exceptions, arguments, variable, and property of the previously executed activity and property of the current activity. In this one, in the immediate panel, you can use to inspect the data. So as of now, we are not passing any data in the variable. That's why it's blank for my demo. But if you are passing multiple variables, then you can see them here. In the call, call, call stack, you can see which activity, activity is going to be executed next. So that is the part of this window, call stack. The breakpoints you can see here, uh, number of breakpoints added. So the, all the breakpoints uh, added in the workflow can be listed here and you can see which one is executed and which one is spent. The watch panel will display the value of the variable or argument and value of the user defined expression that are in the scope. So as of now, we don't have much variable, that's why it's blank. Now I'm gonna talk about the exception handling. So uh, first we should know what is the difference between error and exception. So errors are the event that a particular program can normally handle. So for example, if there is any error, then program will get broken or workflow will be uh, failed. But exceptions are the things which we can, you know, configure and we can recognize uh, and it can be recognized by the program and we can categorize and uh, add some exceptional handling in our workflow so that these exceptions can be handled. There are mainly two types of exception. One is the system exception and another one is business exception. The difference between the system exception and business exception is, for example, if you are automating anything on a web application, then anything related to web application, let's say Google portal is down or something is not responding or a variable is uh, not available, then these all are related to system exception. In case if, let's, let's imagine a scenario where we have an Excel file and uh, business has prepared an Excel file with employee ID and employee name for any of the employee. If employee ID is missing, then these kind of things are business exception because employee ID is mandatory for my workflow. So that's, that can comes under business exception. So all this business ex exception and system exceptions can be handled within our workflow. To handle the exceptions, we have an activity called try catch, which you are going to use uh, mostly in your workflow when you will build the advanced automation. Here you can see the, the activity, how it looks like. It has try block, catch block, and finally block. Finally block is optional. In the try block, you need to put all the activity that could have thrown an exception. So that will all will come under a try. And once the anything or any exception occur, then all should be handled in a catch block. So in the catch block, we need to put or how we want to handle the exception. Here you can see the name is catches. The, re the reason is because you can add multiple catch blocks within here. So a exception can be either a system exception or invalid operation exception or input output exception, null reference ex exception. So you can add multiple catches here. The most common one is system.exception. So it covers all type of exception. But if you want to really know what kind of exception or if you need to further categorize the exception, then you can use other option as well from this exception. And the final finally block is optional because there you can uh, there, there you can keep something optional which you want to uh, achieve after try and catch. So this is optional. Uh, the next one which we use most common is throw and rethrow. So throw, uh, what you can do, for example, let's say if you are working on a workflow where employee ID is missing for an employee, then you can throw an exception saying that new business rule exception. And here you can put your message as a string. So this is the input property for throw. And if there is any exception related to application error, then you can use a throw and say, hey, Google portal is not responding, for example. Uh, another one is rethrow. Why we use this activity? Because uh, sometimes we want to know the exception first, and then we want to terminate the workflow. Otherwise, the, the workflow will be terminated without uh, we know the exception. So it will throw an exception. Uh, which is called in previously exception handling block. And this retro activity must be used in the catch section of the try catch activity. I'm going to quickly show you the demo for this try catch. So first I'll show you the demo for try catch here. 
So this is my activity called try catch. And here I'm trying to uh, type this hello UiPath summer school in a notepad, but you can see my notepad is closed. That's why this will throw an error. And when this will throw an error, you can see I I'm logging here as a uh, error message saying that type into notepad is failed. So if I run this workflow here, Then you can see here the log level type is error. So this is error and you can see type into notepad is failed. I'm also receiving a message box. It says finally blog executed. The reason is because I have just added a finally a message box in the finally block. And if I just click OK and then execution will end. Now let's take an example of throw. For example, if you have an array called 2467 and you are checking here if anything which is not an even number, then throw an exception. So I am throwing an exception for odd number. Let me just run this workflow. So we are running, we are uh, looping it through. So two is the even number we know, four is even number we know, six is even number we know, but seven is odd number. So we are getting an error saying that seven is odd number and UiPath is throwing an error, which we call throw old number error. And in the throw, you can see here, this is my business rule because uh, this comes under business rule, which says new business rule exception, item is an old number. And you can see my message here, item is an old number. So you can customize this message. This will help you to understand what kind of exception uh, occurred. And that's it from my side in today's session. Uh, now I'm handing over to Josh. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ronak. Let me share my screen. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So there's, there's four uh, sections left to cover assets, queues, publishing, and deploying with orchestrator conscious of time. They are fairly short sections, but let's see how we get on. We may park it at a certain point and pivot on to Q and a, um, the first section that we're going to be going through is assets. Um, assets are ultimately, as it says here, uh, assets are configuration values that are pulled at runtime by your automation solutions, and they will live inside of Orchestrator. Now, what I've done is defined three questions that I often hear from individuals when they're first looking to leverage assets um, that should help get to the root reason why we actually leverage them. And it makes your lives easier, my life easier, everybody's lives easier. The first question is, why would I use assets when I can just put the values locally in my automation solutions? And you're correct, you absolutely could do that. Um, now, there's, there's a few reasons why you don't want to do that. Uh, the first is that leveraging assets allows you to centralize those configuration values inside of Orchestrator so they can be leveraged across your various automation solutions. You might have a file path that is used across two or three automations, and that can be shared as a single configuration value inside of Orchestrator. Now, the other reason you would do this is tied to that, which is if business requirements were to change, uh, which they do frequently, I'm, I'm sure you can all attest to, uh, you know, that file path that you were using across those four automations, all of a sudden the business have had an update and that path to that report file that's used has changed. Now, if you were to have the value stored locally in each of your automation solutions, you would then have to go into all four of those, you would have to make an amendment, and then you would have to test and republish, deploy, and then uh, you'd be good to go. Now, if you imagine that at a large scale where you're running, you know, hundreds of solutions, potentially having to consistently edit the code itself, every single time there's a, a minor business requirement change, it's going to become unsustainable very quickly. Making use of assets, however, if we had defined that file path and it was used by those four solutions and the business had a change, we can amend it really easily and it will propagate to each of those solutions with, with minimal effort. Um, there is one additional point, which is you can store credentials inside of assets, which is fantastic. You really don't want to store them locally inside of your solutions or IT will uh, not be very happy. Um, so those can also be housed in assets. The next question is, 
okay, fantastic, right? They have some advantages, but what data types can I actually store as an asset, right? What data types are supported? And there's, there's four data types uh, that you can leverage, and they are text, number, Boolean, and credential, as we've already discussed. Uh, text is, it's your string values, right? It's your file paths. Um, it could be your email body, uh, as we were shown earlier by, um, by Runak. You know, you could have that email body as an asset. And again, multiple processes could leverage that. Easy to update if the business wanted to change the formatting. Number is your numeric values, right? So if you if your solution is only to run a set number of iterations, or if you're um, only looking for a dispatcher solution to pick up a number of items, you could define that as a number, as an asset. Uh, it also supports Boolean values, so true false flags. Uh, this one is quite interesting. Um, I think the biggest use case for me is a scenario where I will um, actually define a test flag uh, for my automation solutions as an orchestrator asset. And when it's running through the steps, it will actually check before each committal activity am I running in test mode? And if I'm running in test mode, I'll skip over portions of the code that would lead to committal activities that I can't reverse. And that lets you do your, your first kind of controlled go live run. Uh, of course, there's tons of other use cases, but that's just my from personal experience. The final one is credentials. Uh, we already talked about it. Um, Worth noting, they're encrypted. I think it's AES-256, uh, both at rest and in transit. So that will keep IT very happy. The one final thing I will say is, don't think you're limited to just those types. Text is obviously very broad and you could use that to store all sorts of different data types, right? It's, it's your kind of catch all. If you need to put a date as an asset, you could put it in text. Um, what you would need to do then is when you actually pull it down into your automation solution, you just need to do a bit of work to pass it. But thanks, thankfully, Ronak has just shown you all how to do that. So it should be a piece of cake. Uh, the final point is, you know, Awesome. Okay, I want to start using these, but actually, I've got a scenario where you know I don't want an asset that's just globally across all of my robots and machines and accounts. I actually need to have specific values for each robot or account. And the good news is you you can do that with assets. So back in the day, this wasn't possible, but Orchestrator has changed a lot over the years, as we're all aware, and it now supports uh, the ability to define global values, but also define robot uh, values on a per robot, per account basis. So you could have your SAP credentials for robot one, two, three, and four, all defined under a single asset name. Um, I do have a, a very rudimentary diagram on the left, which just shows an example of two robots, both requesting the asset uh, report file path and both pulling that asset down so that it can be leveraged at runtime. So, now we know what assets are and why we use them, but we haven't quite touched on how we use them. So there's two main uh, ways to leverage assets. The first is the get assets activity, which will pull you down uh, any asset of type text, Boolean, and number. Uh, and then you've got get credential, which will get you only credentials. In terms of why they are split into two, uh, the reason is ultimately they return different types of data. So get asset will look to retrieve a single value, right? You are saying, get me the asset value for file path, and it gives you back just the file path. Uh, get credential, on the other hand, when you're saying, get me the credentials for SAP, it's giving you back two values. It's giving you back the username and the password, and the password will be a secure string uh, once it arrives at the uh, robot. Um, again, I've got another terrible diagram example here. Uh, you've got your robot requesting orchestrator for the URL to the UiPath Acme uh, website uh, using get asset. And then it's saying, I'll also need the credentials for that website as well using get credentials. Can you give me those? And orchestrator is saying, yes, of course, here you go. Here's the response from the get asset and here's the response from the get credentials. Um, I know this seems very basic, but this is ultimately how it works. What you're doing with get asset and get credential is initiating a request for orchestrator saying, get me the value to this thing. And orchestrator goes, great, here you go. Here's the thing you wanted, as long as everything is configured as it should be. I'm conscious of time. I do have a very simple example. I'll just run through it very quickly. Um, so inside of orchestrator, I have two assets defined. So I have uh, one asset named RPA Summer School Credentials, which is of type credential. And I have another asset 
uh, called RPA Summer School Welcome Message. Uh, it's not going to be a welcome message at this point, it's more of a goodbye message, but, um, but I have that as well. And this is of type text. So all I did to create these was go to add asset, create a new asset and filled in the relevant parameters. Uh, in this case, it was the asset name. I put the description, which is optional and added the text. If you did want to define per robot account values, you can absolutely do that here uh, and you'll have the option too. So inside of Studio, what I'm going to do is just come to here and I'm going to try to get that asset. So to do that, I'm going to use my get asset. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit as well. I'm going to do my get asset activity and I've provided the name of my asset. Keep in mind, this needs to be exact. It needs to be an exact mapping to the asset name inside of Orchestrator. And what I've done here is just provided a variable to store the value that Orchestrator gives me back. So here we go. Uh, str rpa summer school message value and that is here as a string now after that i've just logged it if i was to run this what we should see all being well is a very slow execution of studio there we go so welcome message, hello everyone from Orchestrator. And if I go into Orchestrator, I can see the message here is hello everyone from Orchestrator. Just to prove that this is ultimately retrieving this value and not some hard coded value that I've, I've already created, I'm gonna change this to uh, is nearly time to say goodbye RPA summer school and update that. And if I was to run my solution again, we should see that this message that was logged is amended to that value instead. That was much quicker. It is nearly time to say goodbye, RPA Summer School. So that is assets. I'll run through credentials very quickly. If I disable this and enable this. Uh, so, Sorry, yeah, sure, Christina. Uh, can oh, you ever? just zoom in more because we can't see the activities and yeah that's is that better. that better yeah thank you <laughs> very good thank you for the heads up ever um okay so i've got the get credentials here uh functions very similarly to the get asset as i've said i'm giving it the credential name which again needs to be a one-to-one -one map inside of orchestrator so rpa summer school credentials uh, to RPA summer school credentials. And this one, as we described, is going to give me back two values. One is going to be the username and one is going to be the password. So as we saw before, I've got str RPA summer school username and I've got ST SSTR RPA summer school password. Keep in mind, these can be called anything. They're just the, the local variable names that you use to house the values. As I said, this could be test test one, two, three, if you wanted to. So inside of my variables panel, which I imagine is probably very small, um, you can see, hopefully, the two values I have here, uh, the username, which is of type string, and the password, which is of type secure string. As I said previously, the password will arrive as a secure string, which means you won't be able to log it, technically, um, but you can leverage it for the uh, enter secure string or type into secure string activity when you need to enter passwords. If I run this, what we should see is it will log the username and I've just logged the length of my credential. Again, I appreciate this is probably very small, but it says, if I just go here, um, username is RPA summer school and the password length is six. Okay. So I'll pivot back over. And the next thing I want to go through is making use of orchestrator queues. Um, so orchestrator queues, it's a really interesting concept and it, it's fundamental to scaling RPA. Um, a queue in orchestrator is a list of items that you want processed by your automation solutions. Uh, they, they do quite a few different things. Uh, the first one is that they enforce uniqueness. You can't, or you have the option to prevent adding duplicate items into your queue. And this means that if you were to uh, load the queue twice accidentally, for example, um, it would prevent you adding additional items into the queue that are already there. Uh, this means that all the work that will exist in the queue will be unique. And as such, the robots won't waste effort doubling up and working uh, things that have already been done. It supports robot scaling, which also ties into this. So with orchestrator queues, 
you could have two robots running against a queue um, without doubling up on the work, right? So my diagram on the right hopefully demonstrates this. I've got two robots that are both working from my orchestrator queue. When they both send the request to say, give me an item for work, I wanna do some work, give me the work, right? They both make the request to say, get an item. An orchestrator will uh, distribute the items to each of those robots. Uh, each of them will grab a unique item. I, it is impossible for the two robots to pull the same queue item. So in this example, we've got two robots. They both asked to retrieve a queue item. An orchestrator has said, okay, robot one, you were first, here's queue item one. Robot two, you were second, here's queue item two. If there was only one in there, Robot one would have picked that item and robot two would have possibly been a bit sad, but would have flagged that there's no items available to work and then ended. The final point is that it provides you with some interesting process metrics. So you've got your job metrics, which are great, right? You can see how long your executions last and you can see you know, the logging that goes with that, things of that nature. But with queues, you can actually see more granular detail about your automation solutions. You can see the individual transactions uh, and how long their average handling time is. And you can see failures at a transactional level, right? If you run your job and 10 things failed and you weren't using queues, how would you know? But with queues, you can see of that run of 50 items, 10 of them resulted in a, a system exception as Rona flagged earlier, and maybe five were business exceptions. Uh, when making use of queues, it's, it's common best practice to split into a dispatcher and a performer. Now, this is a pretty, um, this is a pretty big topic, and I'm, I'm not going to delve into it in too much detail, but typically when using queues, the preferred paradigm uh, for building is to make one process, which will be your dispatcher and one which will be your performer. The dispatcher will go into a system and will look for information that the robots need to work. That could be an email inbox. It could be retrieving emails that need to be processed. It might be going into service now and getting tickets that need to be worked, but it will go into those uh, target applications and it will get the necessary details to then add them to the queue. The performer that will pull from the orchestrator queue and then we'll work those items. Um, so as you can see here, I've got an example of a, of, a, of a dispatcher kind of, it's the single robot saying, hey orchestrator, I'm gonna add two items to your queue for my fellow robots to work. And then it's adding two queue items, queue item one and two, and orchestrators coming back saying, great, got both added here. I've got a little bit more on performers. Uh, so once the items are in the queue, the performer that will then begin retrieving them and processing them. So in this scenario, we've got two robots and orchestrator smack bang in the middle. And again, the robot saying, can you give me some work using the get transaction item activity? And the other robot is saying the same and orchestrator is handing out the, um, handing out the queue items to be processed. Now, I'm conscious that we've got about six minutes until the session closes out. Christina, I'm assuming we want time for q and What I might do is just explain the relevant activities that go with orchestrator queues and then perhaps pause there. Yes, yeah, that's a good idea. We should, uh, after that, we should hold a menti and then Q&A. So okay. we should keep that, Perhaps that sounds... we will go over like five minutes. Okay, that's fine. Well, I tell you what then, I'll finish up on queues and then we'll, we'll go from there. So. Um, if I just open up Studio and go into my queue example very quickly, um, what I have here, and again, we can send this out, out off the back of the session, but we have effectively a dispatcher and a performer, a very rudimentary dispatcher and a very rudimentary performer. So what my dispatcher is going to do, it's going to read a spreadsheet file, which is here. And I'll just zoom in a little bit. And what I'm saying is pretend this is data that comes out of your favorite ITSM ticketing tool, and it's got ticket numbers, it's got their priority, it's got the description, they've exceeded SLA, and it's got a contact to reach out to. So let's imagine this process uh, looks to find the items that have exceeded SLA and give somebody a prod that they need to be uh, processed. Um, so it's going to read that file. Uh, once it's read that file, it's going to iterate through each of the uh, rows within that spreadsheet, and it's going to add queue items into my queue. If I go to Orchestrator and go to queues, I already have a queue here called RPA Summer School. And again, I'll zoom in just a smidge to make sure it's suitably sized. 
And if I come back into here, inside of my add queue item, I don't need to provide a lot of the details here, but some of the key ones that you'll need are the queue name that you're targeting. The other one is the folder path. So inside of Orchestrator, there is the concept of folders, and I've just given it the RPA Summer School folder because that's the one that my queue exists in. I could have this queue in both folders potentially, so I just need to tell it which one it's looking for it inside of. Uh, and the other thing is this item collection here. Again, I appreciate this might be a little small, but this is where I give all of the details from the spreadsheet into the queue items so that they exist inside of Orchestrator for my performer to work. If I run this and disable my performer, what we should see is my queue gets populated with all of the items from that spreadsheet. There we go. So there's my three items that have been added into the queue. You can see the reference was put down as the ticket number out of the spreadsheet. And if I go into view details, we can see all of the data that was in that spreadsheet has been added into the queue. Uh, there is uh, something to flag here around being careful about what information that you log into or store in these queue items, but that's possibly a topic for another day. Um, but you can see I've added all of the data into my queue items. What I'm going to do is just demonstrate then how you might retrieve that data and process it. So I'm going to disable my dispatcher and I'm going to enable my performer. And what this is going to do, it's inside of a while because we want it to loop as long as there are items to be processed inside of our queue. And it's going to use the get transaction item activity, which is again going to take the queue name. It's going to take the folder path that that queue exists inside of. It's got a, an output item, which is the transaction item that was pulled from the queue. Uh, after that, it's going to do a quick check to see if there are any items in our queue. So it just says, if the transaction item that we pulled is in fact blank, then just break the loop. If it isn't, it's going to just send some logs and then it's going to mark the transaction as a success. This is the other activity that you need to be aware of, which is set transaction status. If I go into properties, again, there's a few options here. Um, in this circumstance, I'm marking them as success. You could mark them as fail. If you mark them as fail, you'll need to add in the relevant details for the failure reason. Um, it could be the exception message. Uh, to be honest, it should be the exception message, but you could put some additional supplementary data in there as well. Now, I'm just going to run the performer and we can see it work that queue and we'll go from there. So if I give this a run, Okay, if I go to my output, I can see it's logging that the transaction started and ended, and it's giving me a log that just provides some details around the, uh, the queue items that were worked. So sending email to contact josh.davy at evolvent.com. Uh, email details, please update your P1 ticket with the description, all servers are on fire. Uh, I can see it's done that three times for my three queue items. And if I go back into my queue and refresh, I can see that all three of the items are now marked as success. And as I flagged previously, I can see the start and end times of these transactions, and I can get information around the average handling time for this process. Now, this is so quick that the average handling time is effectively zero. Um, but if you had an actual process that was doing processing, it would be most likely longer than, than less than a second. Um, at this point, the next piece would be on to uh, go on to publishing in studio. Um, I think Maybe Christina Park here, unless you're happy for me to continue and. Um, how how much uh, do you estimate? Like uh, it would take. I can I can I can rattle through it in about three minutes. I just want to. I'm just conscious of everybody's time. That's all. Okay, let's go through it. And because okay. uh, who has to drop off uh, will get the recording, so I think it's important to complete it, and then we'll move into the quiz. Very good. Okay, so publishing a project in Studio, uh, this is fairly simple. Um, inside of Studio, there is there is an option for publish at the top, uh, and if you select publish, it will um, bring up this window that's shown on the right here, uh, and you can publish it into Orchestrator from there. Again, I've got another diagram that just shows uh, Studio here and the publish process moving that package from uh, studio into Orchestrator. Uh, what Publish does is actually twofold. It packs your source code into a NuGet package, and then it pushes it across to Orchestrator. It's worth noting that if there's any validation errors inside of your code, the pack uh, inside of the Publish will actually fail, and you'll need to amend those validation errors before you can complete the Publish. 
uh, inside of Studio, you can find this option under Design, and here is just a Publish option. And it's it's uh, it's a very simple. What you see is what you get interface. Um, nothing to particularly call out. The only thing I would say is that the version numbers will automatically increment for you. You do not need to worry about those necessarily. Uh, each time you publish, uh, UiPath Studio is clever enough to say, okay, the current version is 1.0.2. I'm going to increment to 1.0.3 for you. And once you hit publish and that goes up to Orchestrator, it will automatically increment the value inside of your project JSON. Uh, deployment to Orchestrator, this one's fairly simple. Once your package is inside of Orchestrator, you then just need to create a process and tie that to your package, uh, and then you can begin running jobs. If I go into Orchestrator and go to tenants and then go to packages, you can actually see what I've just published is here. So RPA Summer School Examples, and it was published a few seconds ago. If I wanted to leverage this, all I'd need to do is come into a folder um, where I'm gonna run it, go to automations, add a process, I can select the package, which is RPA Summer School Examples here. Uh, you can see it's giving me my package version, which I know is correct. The entry point is the file that it's going to leverage uh, as main, the one that it's going to execute first. And then if I go to next, uh, it just gives me some information about the assets and queues that are being used, which is very helpful. It means that you can see everything is available. And then you just hit next, give it a display name, and say RPA Summer School. And I will leave everything else as it should be. There are a lot of options here. I would encourage you to take a look inside of the, uh, the community orchestrator. Um, but if I hit create, that is now available and I could start that process. Uh, I'm not gonna do it. I don't actually have an unattended robot defined inside of this folder, but if I was to run this and there was one available, it would then trigger and begin processing on that machine. Uh, so that's everything done fairly fairly rapidly, I would say. So I will hand back over to you, Christina, to go back onto the quiz, if that works. Okay, sure. So let's, uh, let's uh, move into the quiz now. Okay, I hope uh, everyone can see the screen. I will share again the code for those of you who jumped out of the quiz room and we will wait 10 more seconds for you to get back if there's anyone who well, it's not in the quiz room now. So the code is uh, this one, 56625236 on www.menti.com. So just uh, please confirm to me in the chat that you are in the quiz room or whether we should wait any longer. Is everybody in the quiz room? Can you guys just say yes, joined or uh, okay? <laughs> okay, then uh, let's start the quiz. If uh, everybody is there. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. So this was the final leaderboard. This is where we left after the first two questions. And now we're moving into the third question. And remember to answer fast to get more points. So what is the best way to store credentials, username and password for the automation? Orchestrator assets, safe box, bank vault, or post-it note? As you can see, you have some funny options here too, which makes it easier. Exemplary, so everyone got the question right. This is a very nice uh, outcome. Let's see the leaderboard after the third question. Okay, so Akanksha is still uh, leading. Uh, let's move into the final question now, which will uh, determine our uh, winner for today's quiz. Question four. Which debug action prevents the debug execution to stop, pause on errors? Don't stop errors, continue on exception, ignore errors, resume debug. OK. 
Okay, again, most of you got this right. It was a bit harder than the previous one. Uh, not so many uh, funny options on this one, only uh, a bit confusion. Okay, let's see now the final leaderboard and our winner for today. Okay, so Aubrey is our winner for today. Uh, Aubrey, please uh, send me in a DM your email address uh, on the Zoom chat so uh, we can send you the winner's voucher. Thank you everyone for participating in the quiz. And uh, now we will move a bit into Q&A so uh, we can see uh, what questions you have from our session today. So please feel free now to uh, ask, uh, to unmute and ask your questions to Rona, to Josh or to Ebru. Any of you who has uh, questions from the uh, session today, just please unmute, you are able to unmute, so. Yeah. No questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, then I'm going to quickly, uh, Yes, the presentations and the recordings. Okay, Hakshit, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask that directly. Is it possible to uh, to have multiple catches? Yes, it is. Okay, we have another one. Is there any place where we can get orchestrator tutorial? Uh, yes, you can get that uh, on Academy. You have orchestrator. I know you asked whether it is in the community version. It is. Uh, I'm uh, also, yesterday's presentations were not posted in the URL. Yes, they were, and I will show you right now. Uh, and I will also uh, give you a bit of follow-up to the session and to the RPA Summer School now. So uh, just uh, for uh, all of you guys to, to know like what should be your journey following this program. So uh the destination to go is of course UiPath Academy I know most of you are familiar with it this is our free training platform so uh, any of you who have you are not familiar yet with Academy should uh, enter and check out the website for our Academy and uh, in Academy you can uh, go here into learning by role and you will see here the RPA developer foundation which should be now your dedicated journey from now on uh, you should uh, enroll into this uh, course. It has several modules, of course, but you can only access them if you start the course. Uh, you can see here the whole learning plan curriculum, and you will see a lot of familiar subjects already here. So uh, your journey should lead you into finishing this course in Academy, which should uh, give you a certain level of uh, expertise already. You already started. So you, as, you said, as I said, uh, there are already some familiar subjects. So it should be easier now for you to go through this course and continue in Academy. Also, we, we uh, will uh, design a special nurturing stream in the learners chapter where these events will publish to, for you to be able to continue also with our session. But uh, make sure you check out this uh, course in Academy and you can tell us now in the chat how many of you are already involved in RPA Developer Foundation since this uh, would be the main goal of the sessions. You get a diploma, yes, after you finish each course in Academy, you get a diploma. As you can see here, diploma of completion included, yes. So each Academy course gives you a diploma. Uh, please tell us how many of you are already enrolled in the RPA Developer Foundation in Academy. Just let us know in the chat. Okay, good. And I hope most of you plan on continuing their journey in the RPA Developer Foundation in Academy. And I hope also the RPA Summer School helped a lot into initiating that journey because it is a bit e e easier when you start it attended and assisted, especially with help from our MVPs. Okay, great. Uh, then I will give you again the links and uh, before we close the session. So uh, just remember uh, the recording and the presentation will be available on this link and you will also receive it by email. So you will find it here. Yes. And remember uh, also please the form thread, which is very important for your journey because it will help you a lot from now on, especially if you especially if you go into academy. So 
please use this form thread. Do not forget about it. Yes. Okay. As I said before, you will receive next week an invitation to take a quiz from the RPA Summer School to check your knowledge. And uh, following that quiz, you will also get a diploma for the RPA Summer School, provided you have a passing score. Thank you all for joining. Uh, you can tell us, give us a bit of feedback also. Perhaps we will send a feedback form about how the summer school went for you, uh, how the sessions were, how did you find it? And also a big thank you to our trainers uh, today and uh, to all the four sessions. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Rona. Thank you, Ebru. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Thank you. Best of luck on your RPA journey. Thanks. Bye, guys.